Here's an example. A random variable represents the pH of arterial plasma, which is the acidity of the blood. For adult, healthy adults, the mean of the random variable distribution is 7.4. A new drug for arthritis has been developed. However, it is thought that this drug may change blood pH. A random sample of 31 patients with arthritis took the drug for three months. Blood tests showed that the sample mean is 8.1 with a simple stan sample standard deviation of 1.9, finding 95% confidence interval for the mean pH level of the blood. So the first thing I want to do is figure out what are we trying to do. Um, it looks like an inference because it's looking like it wants me to make a decision of some kind. So I look in the problem, I see uh, the words confidence interval. So that tells me we are going to do a confidence interval. Um, then I also want to find out whether we're doing mean, proportion, some other random variable. And I do see the word mean here. So I can tell we're talking about mean. And then I notice that we're talking about just a sample mean of one value that was done. So there was just a sample taken. So that means there was one sample. So this is a one sample. Um, because we're doing a mean, it is called a T interval. So we're doing a one sample T interval. Um, every confidence interval is done with the same process. You're going to first start off with stating the random variable and mean in this case, whatever your parameter is. Um, we are told that we had a random variable as the pH of arterial plasma. Um, the thing is that that is for anybody. Now we're looking at just for this new drug. So we're looking at what would it actually be for the new drug. So that means that my random variable actually is the pH of arterial plasma of a patient on the new drug for arthritis. And therefore our random, our mean, our per parameter is the mean pH of arterial plasma of a patient on this new drug for arthritis. So you want to be as wordy as you can here to say exactly what it is you tried to find. Now, the second step of a confidence interval is to state and check the assumptions. So the first assumption of every confidence interval with the, the T interval is that you have a random sample. The second one is that your population is normally distributed. So in this case, we're going to first state them in terms of the problem. So we had a random sample of pH levels of arterial plasma was taken from 31 patients using the new drug for arthritis. So um, I can put all that together because my random variable is the pH of arterial plasma of a patient on the new drug. But I got the 31 because there was 31 was the size of a sample. So um, the problem does state that it was a random sample. So we can actually say that we had a simple random sample. Um, it says it right up here that a random sample was taken. So we're good with that. Um, the second one is that we have a normal dis normally distributed population. So the population of, again, the pH level of arterial plasma of patients on the new drug for arthritis. Um, and this is for all patients now because population is for all, is normally distributed. Um, the problem doesn't say anything about that. We don't actually have the data, so I can't actually do the um, assessments for normality to see if it is normal. Um, but I did notice that our sample size is over 30. So if we're over 30, then the central limit theorem kind of falls into play. So we're okay. We don't need to really worry about it in this case. Normally, though, you should have the actual data in front of you and be able to do assessments of normality. All right, so now we can move on to the third step. The third step of every hypothesis test is to come up with your sample statistic and your confidence interval. In this case, they actually told us what x-bar was, and they told us the sample mean, and they told us the sample mean actually was 7, I'm sorry, 8.1. Um, they also told us what the sample standard deviation was. They told us the sample standard deviation of this problem was 1.9. And they also told us that we had a random sample of size 31, so n is 31. The only other thing we need is to find out what e is. Um, that's your error that you're having in the problem. So we do that changes for every confidence interval you do. In this case, e is t sub c times the standard deviation over the square root of n. The standard deviation of the square root of n is actually the st um, standard error of the estimate. Um, so every single confidence interval will have a standard error of the estimate times some distribution value that gives us a probability. So we have to figure out what that t sub c is. 
Um, basically, T, so see if you look at the T curve, this is the student's T distribution. If you look at the student's T curve that's centered at zero, um, we're looking for those values T sub C and negative T sub C such that this area is, in this case, let's go back to the problem, um, we do want to do a 95%. So in this case, we want this area to be 95%. Um, this is hard to find. And so we do want to actually, um, we have a table that we can use to get us that information. Um, the thing is with the t-distribution, the shape of this changes depending on your degrees of freedom. So you do need to find the degrees of freedom. Um, for the one sample t-interval, the degrees of freedom is always n minus 1. So given that we had 31, our degrees of freedom would be 30. So we want to do a 95% confidence interval with degrees of freedom of 30. So we can go to our table. Um, you'll notice that along the top are percentages. We are at a 95%, so we're going to use this column. You're going to come down. This first column here are your degrees of freedom. So you're going to come down to you find a degrees of freedom of 30. And then where they intersect, right there, that is your critical value. So that's your T sub C. So it's, in this case, 2.042. All right, so we can go back over here and say that our T sub C is 0 point, sorry, 2.042. So now you can get what E is. E is going to be 2.042 times 1.9 over the square root of N, which is 31. Take out your calculator, and you find out that E is approximately 0 0.7. I usually go to the same number of decimal places as I have for my, ran, my uh, sample statistic. So now we can do x bar minus e is less than, hopefully it's a true mean, and x bar plus e. So you'd have 8.1 minus 0 0.7 to 8.1 plus 0 0.7. So that turns out to be 7.4 is less than mu is less than 8.8. .8. All right, so now that we have our confidence interval, we want to talk about what does this interval mean. So we want to do our statistical and real-world interpretation. The statistical interpretation of every confidence interval is basically the same. We, this was a 95% confidence interval, so we are 95% confident. That the interval... Seven point four is less than mu is less than eight point eight contains the true mean. Some people like to write this the other way around and say that the interval there's a ninety-five percent confidence confidence that the true mean is between those two values, but that actually implies that the true mean is moving around and that the interval is fixed. In reality, the interval is what moves around. That's the piece that you're not sure is correct. Um, and the mean itself is constantly out there somewhere. It's fixed out there. So you want to actually say it in this way because that actually does reiterate the fact that the interval itself is the one that's moving, that you're not sure whether it's true or not. Um, you are sure where the mean is. You just don't know for sure where that is, is kind of the idea. All right, and then we get the real world. This is one reason I um, suggest that you write down your uh, random variable and parameters. Our parameter in this case was the mean pH of patients on the new drug for arthritis. And so now for real world interpretation, we can actually say that the mean pH of um, arterial blood or plasma, sorry, arterial plasma, um, for patients on the new drug for arthritis, is between 7.4 and 8.8. .8. 
So we're telling people what we found it to be. So we're pretty confident. We're 95% confident that we just made a true statement. And we can now say that um, that's what the value is. If you are on this arterioplasma drug, I'm sorry, on this arthritis drug, your pH of your blood would be between 7.4 and 8.8. .8. Um, as a side note, we were told that a, for a normal healthy adult, that value for what the mean is, is 7.4. Um, 7.4 is in this interval. It's actually one of the endpoints of this interval. So since 7.4 is actually in this interval, then our mean could in fact be 7.4. So it may be that the new drug does not actually change um, the pH of blood. All right. It could be any value in this range. We don't know which one it is. It could be all the way up to 8.8. .8. But because 7.4 is actually in that interval, we actually can't say that it would change it.